Thank you guys once again for having me. My name is Carlton Shield Chief Gover, and the presentation that I'm giving you guys tonight um, is based on my thesis research um, and master's thesis at the University of Wyoming um, from two years ago. So I like to call this dating apps in archaeology, matching the archaeological record with indigenous oral traditions, glottochronology, some probability distributions, Bayesian statistical analysis. I'm really big on puns, so this was kind of like a modern dating scene with the online apps. Um, I just couldn't resist. So just uh, real quick, a little bit about me. Uh, as you guys have already mentioned, I am a PhD student here in anthropology at CU Boulder, very close to getting my candidacy. I'm very excited. Got my master's from University of Wyoming and my bachelor's of science from uh, Radford University in uh, Virginia. As already mentioned, I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma and the unofficial tribal archaeologist, basically the TIPO and NAGPRA agent and cultural resources division. Uh, get my opinion on almost everything uh, pro bono. Uh, very looking forward to finishing up and working for the tribe. Uh, I was the 2020 recipient of the CCP CCPA, Native American Summer Scholarship, and I'm also a research associate of the new archaeological school in Ukraine, um, where I found that the Ukrainian archaeological record is very similar to what we see in the uh, Central planes. So I'm kind of using these two dualities to help better make me a, a, a more efficient archaeologist. And I'm also a very avid science communicator. I love giving presentations. I am a host of a uh, archaeology based podcast called A Life in Ruins. Um, and also we do a lot of stuff on um, social media and we're starting to get into comic books now um, so you can see with the picture to the left so really happy to be here really happy to be talking to you guys this is my bread and butter i hate writing papers but i love giving presentations um, so let's finally get started. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to briefly talk about the oral traditions, and we're going to use those oral traditions to construct a relative chronology um, for population movement and population diffusion. Then we're going to look at glotto chronological analysis of language. Um, and this is really used to kind of give a rough estima estimation as to when we can identify population divergence. SPDs, this is some probability distributions. Uh, you aggregate radiocarbon data in an area and you run uh, some probability distribution through them and you can find population trends, or so we believe. And then lastly, we're going to go over some Bayesian statistical analysis to give like precision um, sequential relationships between some of these archaeological cultures. And I have a couple hypotheses. Um, so, in, and as we'll go through this, um, in order to better uh, represent the indigenous, the descendant communities that I talked to, I actually, I don't refer to the Pawnee as the Pawnee or the Rikra as the Rikra, which was Wichita. I refer to them as the their, their own nation designation. So, Chadix uh people of people, this is the Pawnee. Um, and then we have the Saunish, which is the people, which are the Rikra. And then the Krikaris, not quite sure what that translation is, but might be the raccoon people. So first, my first hypothesis, the Chadix saw Chadix are descendant communities of the Central Plain tradition and initial coalescent variant populations. Oral tradition accounts of Northern Kadoan migration, which is the Chadix saw Chadix, the Saunish, the Karikaris, uh, migration into the Central Plains comes from the Southeast of Nebraska, of Nebraska. And these are accurate accounts. And lastly, ethnogenesis or the formation of identity of what we know as the Chadix saw Chadix today and the Saunish occurs in the 16th century. And, and why am I doing this research? Why is, uh, what, what was the impetus for, for all this? It, it honestly stems from a conversation I had with my father a long time ago in which I asked my dad, hey dad, where did the Pawnee come from? And he's like, uh, I think we're related to the Aztecs. And, and this, is, this isn't, uh, you know, unheard of in the Pawnee Nation, there was this book in Archaeology of the Soul um, by Robert Hall in which he he looks at the P Skeety Pawnee or Skeety Chudik Sachidik's um, morning star ceremony, which was a ritual sacrifice, and compares it to these Mesoamerican cultures and publishes in this book. And some people in, in the nation and elsewhere in academia have seen this, especially in the 80s, as like, oh, there must be the relationship because of this. Um, so this is kind of where this stems from. And it was basically as I went to grad school, uh, my my research is focused on trying to identify well what is what is my tribal what, what's 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 the Pawnee's history um, outside and mostly you know you have a couple books and you have the archaeological record which really doesn't go too too much into this. Um, so this was kind of my journey. This wasn't like I found this to be fun. I hate statistics, um, so I never would have thought of myself using SBDs or Bayesian, um, but these were the tools I needed to answer a question that I've held for a long time. 
So as I mentioned, these investigated tribes refer to by their own names, um, and as their list here. And uh, I, I firmly believe that oral traditions of migration and population relatedness are tested through multiple statistical pa packages, especially coming from Wyoming, which is a hardcore processual data driven school in order to make, um, a lot of these interpretations, they had to be based on quantitative data. So I really had to pull multiple lines of, of research and evidence together to make a strong conclusion as we all should in science. And, you know, coming off the bat, some people would think this is a cultural historical approach in archaeology. This is what archaeologists did pre Binford. But, you know, this is really rooted in indigenous archaeology, um, which is fundamental to say I use indigenous oral traditions, indigenous knowledge with indigenous people um, to help guide my research, which I, you know, I hate the term indigenous archaeology because to me, all North American archaeologists should be working with indigenous people and indigenous knowledge. Um, so the fact that it's its own separate entity or paradigm within our field is is bothersome. And that's not, you know, without cause, because some people like Robert McGee and especially, especially don't believe indigenous oral traditions are, are valid. And he equates them as religious belief that they're just made up. Um, but that's just not true. And we should avoid these, as I like to call Sith like behavior from a Star Wars reference and dealing in absolutes that, um, traditional archaeological evidence is not the only venue to the past that oral traditions because of the you know i'm not going to get too much into it but the socio-cultural nature of of oral traditions within a nation like they have to be accurate and and so just now that we've kind of covered all this where are we talking about where are the chadak sachadiks and where are the sonish well this and this is what we call historically which i you know i hate that term you know post contact really we're looking at 19th century distributions in this map that before European colonialism and, and westward expansion, some of these nations would have not have been here. But if you look to the map on the left of your screen, the number one represents where the Sonish are, the number two represents where the Chidex Sachidex are, number three represents where the Karikaris are. So um, very much in the plains, you have the Sonish in the northern plains, the Chadex Sachidex in the central plains, and the Karikaris on the southern plains. And these are all bounded by language. They're part of the north, uh, the north, um, yeah, northern Kadoan language family, a part of the Kadoan language. Now, you know, post contact, these villages by and large are large earth lodge villages, except for the Karikaris. Instead of large earth lodge villages, they're la large um, grass lodge villages. Biannual bison hunting with maize based agriculture. Anytime you have big populations on the plains, you're doing two things you're growing corn and you're killing buffalo. Um, and these are really an aggregate of independent bands, not, you know, one nation as we think today. And sometimes these are fortified, especially the Sonish. Those are fortified, and um, later in history, Chadix Sachadix villages become fortified. And when we look at the political structure of these things, um, the Chadex Sachadex have four bands, the Sonish have 18 to 42. Um, and, and for the purposes of what I'm going to be talking about, when I refer to the South Band Chadex Sachadex, we're referring to the Kitkahaki, Pitahawarada, and the Chawi. Um, and the Skidi, they make up 13 to 12 villages. They're a, they're a federation of clans, whereas the South Band Chadex Sachadex are, you know, made up of one to two villages and are, are comprised in, in that way. And the Sonish, 18 to 42 bands, we're not quite sure the number, um, and each had their own village. And, and what I have down here is this spectrum is the further south you get, the more culturally South Band you get, and the further north you get, the more um, culturally sun issue get with the skidi being in the middle, having a blend of a Rikara of, of traits, especially in language similarity and also South band practices. So rather than thinking about it in modern context of these independent unities, you know, in the past, what's to say that these were really true boundaries? Um, the languages are extremely similar. I think in this is personal opinion, Doug Parks has kind of inflated the differences in the, in the languages and dialects and, uh, you know, a time before colonialism, how close these groups would have been with one another. Um, they're much more similar than they are different. And I have to give a huge shout out to uh, Roger Echo Hawk, who is here with us tonight, and uh, his wife, Linda. Um, I highly recommend, if you guys are interested in oral traditions, and especially Chadik Sachadik's oral traditions, um, you get his book, um, Ancient Pawnee Land. And I love this quote, which really sums up oral traditions. Long ago, in every city of Pawnee Land, when night fell among the earth lodges in the camps, people would gather to tell stories. There would follow long hours of narrative cinematic journey 
every evening distant star would waft through the dark above the storytellers of Pawnee land. That oral traditions and storytelling are a huge part of these of these cultures, especially in the past. And this was the without a written record or without, you know, the ability with, with that, you know, telling the tribal history is extremely important. And, you know, once again, huge shout out to him for the oral traditions that I use in this paper and that I've used to further my dissertation. Um, this is really all coming from Roger Echo Hawk, um, who's collected the, all these from various sources. He's this is, has been his life work. He is a graduate of University of Colorado Boulder. Um, he wrote a very popular um, article and essay in American Antiquity called Ancient History in the New World, in which he argues um, for the use of indigenous oral traditions being accurate and should be included in archaeological interpretation. And then also his three-part series, Ancient Pawnee Land, where he really goes into a deep dive about Pawnee history, culture, and um, racial identity. And why I use the oral traditions, it gives you a coarse gain of coarse grain approach to understanding the archaeological record um, because they don't really give dates they give if they give sequential events without um, precision dating and one of the most uh, important ones that will that will come across here is, is um, a skeedy chadix sachadix oral history that states the skeedy federation the the founding of these clans was founded along beaver creek also known as wild licorice creek near genoa nebraska um, and before this federation was formed, the people lived in small scattered hamlets with square shaped structures. Afterwards, they adopted their circular earth lodge. And, and for this purposes of my research, you know, a lot of these oral traditions, you know, you have to skim through some of these hero stories, but this gives a place. And most importantly, it gives a settlement pattern. It talks about small square hamlets and then the earth lodge, extremely important. And, and more importantly, the location. This is what we call the closed man story. And, and you know, keep that in mind as we move forward. And rather than just, you know, word vomiting all of these oral traditions to you guys, I'm just going to go through a quick brief uh, synopsis of what they're saying. So I collected oral traditions from the Sanish, Chadik Sachadiks, and the, and the Karikaris, and to, hopefully to get one large narrative, and I was able to do so. So they talk about coming from a land of stone houses somewhere in the southwest. We don't know where that is. There's just land of stone houses out to the west. There's a migration to the Mississippi River, but along the way where the, the crossing of the two timbers, the Saunish split off from the main group of Chadix, Sachadix, and Creekeries, and they moved north and settled, settled in southern Nebraska as represented by um, the blue line. I'm really bad at Photoshop, so I use Microsoft Paint, so please bear with me. As the Saunish or pre-Saunish are in southern Nebraska, northern Kansas, as the rest of the group is migrating northward along the Mississippi River, the Skeedy branch off, and they go join the Saunish in Nebraska and Kansas, probably following the Missouri River. The Saunish get displaced by the Skeedy. Something happens. But as they're there, um, the South Banchadix, Sachadix, and the Karikaris, um, they start traveling along the Missouri River. They branch off from the Mississippi and start traveling along. They're all hanging out. You now have the Saunish really in southern South Dakota along the Missouri. The ancestral Skidi are somewhere in central Nebraska. The South Bands and the Karikaris are somewhere in northern Kansas, southern Nebraska. But that green line is representing at some point the, the Karikaris branch off and go further south back into Oklahoma. There's, there's diverging. This is the only place where... Um, part of some of these oral traditions where some of the evidence got diverged, where some were saying, oh, well, we hung out in southern, uh, northern Kansas for a bit, then left, or we just dropped off the South Band, uh, Chidix, Sachidix, and went back south. But for the purposes of this, it doesn't really matter. Then we have um, abandonment at some point. Um, all these groups acknowledge like they left Nebraska and Kansas. Um, they're probably up in um, northern Nebraska or southeastern Kansas. We really don't know. And there was only one or two oral traditions I was able to find that talk about this. For the others, there was a breadth of information. And then we get start getting to the historical period after this abandonment or uh, depopulation of Nebraska and Kansas. That's when the Saunish really start moving up the, Miss the Missouri River into their historic homeland and the Skeedy and South Bands come back. And um, then you kind of get these general historical uh, boundaries that we see in the 19th century, that this is where they're kind of located. Um, but the problem with all this, as I mentioned earlier, that without any mention of dates, you know, these oral accounts are, are when which they occurred or when they occurred are speculative at best, 
and can only provide a relative chronology, but that's where you need to start, right? It's like you have to have an idea of like, okay, if this is what they're saying, you can start developing expectations of how it can be um, seen or witnessed in the archaeological record. Um, but now it's kind of figuring out, well, especially in one of those war traditions talking where the um, Sanish and Chidiks, Sachidiks talk about separating from one another, it's, it's absolutely reasonable to speculate that language should separate as well. So that's what I started looking for is like when, you know, language separation is a huge characteristic of um, separation from the two. That as language separates, especially if they had a, a common language in the past, that there should be separation between the two. Um, there is correlation that we know between genetic population language groups. So part of all, all this was also showing like, are the Sanish, Chedek, Sachedeks, and Krikris related with one another as their oral traditions say? So that was kind of the basis of this. However, there's still factors um, for genetically unrelated populations sharing the same language, cultural assimilation, language adoption, and so forth. So it really had to be looked into. And that's what I did. This is an overview of the Kodoan language family. You have Kado proper. But then in the Proto-Northern Kodoan language family, this is where you see the groups that we're all looking at. And lucky for me, there was a lot of glottochronology done. And, you know, as archaeologists, glottochronology was big in the 50s and 60s. But the problem with glottochronology, which we'll get to later, there's a reason why it's not done anymore. But just kind of taking... Um, Doug Parks and Swadesh and Wettelfish's um, analyses just to look at what we're looking at. We're really trying to focus, if you look on the left, the Pawnee Arikara and the Arikara Wichita, but specifically Pawnee and Arikara. And as you can see, they're all kind of bounded within the past, you know, 500 years. Uh, uh, the difference between glottochronological and impressionistic, an impressionistic date is, um, Doug, this is coming from Doug Parks, this is someone who has um, authority in the language and they're saying, you know, I did the glottochronology, it says 300, but realistically it's 500 years. So we're looking at really a 500 to 300 year um, separation, which is excellent in terms of archeological um, investigation. Cause this allows me to narrow my time frame for trying to find the, at least a part of this relative chronology. And so using that 500 to 300, um, the 15th century becomes identified as a temporal candidate. Um, and since the language separation only occurred within the past few hundred years, we have this variability in morph date, morphine decay. And this was the big problem with glottochronology back in the day is that language doesn't, is not, it doesn't change at a constant. And in part of this um, statistical analysis, language decay is constant, but, and that's what we're talking about, morphine decay. But, and, and I reasoned that having the language separation so recent that that variability in language change cannot have, should not be affecting or distort the target event very greatly. And, you know, and this is really just to, to narrow in my investigation. I'm really not taking too much in the glottochronology. I'm mostly just saying, okay, when is a window I should be looking for in the record on the central plains for my investigation? And that's where we start getting into it. So, um, there's some several archaeological cultures that, you know, you guys need to be familiar with. As I talk about it, we have the central plain tradition, the initial coalescent variant, the extended coalescent variant, lower and lower loop phase. And this is all coming from Lemmer 1954. This is all part of the plains village pattern. Um, and really the differences between these archaeological cultures is pottery, architecture, settlement pattern, and geographic location. And most importantly, especially for the central plain tradition, it's really the geographical location rather than the other three. And this is just a brief um, general characteristics of what we're talking about. Um, we really don't need to go into this too detailed, but just keep in mind the temporal spans and just trust me when I say that uh, these are all different. And once again, going off these temporal spans, um, if you look, you can see when a lot of these end and the others begin, and it's the 15th century once again, and uh, uh, that is, uh, illuminated 15th and 16th centuries as a period of transformation. That's what we're seeing the end of some of these small aggregate villages into these larger earth lodge villages. And we have, um, thankfully from a lot of the work of archeologists in the past, um, we have a good idea of what's going on. You have the central plain tradition first, this is followed by initial coalescent and initial coalescent variant splits into lower loop phase, which then becomes historic tritic and uh, on the other side, it becomes extended coalescent variant, which then becomes post-contact coalescent, 
which is historic Sonish. And when we're looking at CPT, so this is this is the earliest one, right? And this is showing up around 950 AD at the earliest phase is what they're called. But um, this is the map to the left. You can see a little bit of the initial coalescent variant to the, to the north, but if you can see where it's bounded, and it's also part of Colorado here on the far left. I'm pointing at my monitor like you guys can see what I'm pointing at. I apologize. Um, but these, these sites, especially it's going to be an upper Republican, they have campsites in Wyoming and Colorado, and this is, and they're bringing in pottery made from uh, central Nebraska out to Colorado and Wyoming and bringing back raw material and bison. And if you look at the tribal territories map, which I showed you earlier, and I know it's really small, this is dead center of historic um, Chudik Sachudik's um, territory. So why why CPT end? It's it ends around 1450. Well, there's there's a couple um, theories. One is drought. Um, Three Amigos, great movie, and prolonged sweat in agriculture. And real and realistically, I think Blakesley 1994 says it's it's probably a mix of the two because drought, um, the sweat in agriculture, you know, it it um, degrades the soil. There you know, there's a lot of runoff, and then once it's hit by drought, it just blows away. And we can see this, that we use a, uh, the Palmer Drought Severity Index, and I've, I've, I've illuminated a couple things, that there's some pretty um, severe and prolonged droughts in the 13 and 1400s. There's intermediate, intermittent wet years, but it's really it's really dusty during this time. And so that's that's represented by A and B. And just to, to, to show you guys the gravity of this, uh, Circle C is representing um, the Dust Bowl. So... That lasted for a blip compared to what's going on in the Central Plains in the same area that was occurring in the 14th and 15th centuries. And as we as, as we look at the Central Plains tradition, you know, realizing this 15th century, not only is the language saying this is a period of transformation, the archaeological record is saying this is a period of transformation. I'm pretty solid with this is an area I should be looking at. So I start looking at the archaeological record of the Central Plains tradition with a lot of these oral traditions and start seeing similarities. The Itzkari phase um, from a ski D oral tradition where you're evidence for relationship to geographical location, settlement pattern, that closed man ceremony, small square hamlets, or ha small hamlets and, and square houses, and this is the settlement pattern of Central Plains tradition. We have the Nebraska phase, South Band's geographical location, and Campbell Creek phase, Sonish and Skeedy, geographical location and settlement patterns stating, yeah, we came here with square houses, but then we had earth lodges and we, and we aggregated together. So part of this whole, you know, one of my main hypotheses is like, okay, if this is historic or if this, these are ancestral populations, um, the Sonish, the, the Karikaris, the Chidiks, the Chidiks, they're saying they're migrating in um, to this area and with migration you have population surges. And uh, so I use some probability distributions of radiocarbon data as a proxy for prehistory, prehistoric uh, demographics. And so this is used to find population trends. Like if the people are migrating, we should be able to see it. And so um, I was very fortunate to be at Wyoming at the time as Dr. Bob Kelly was doing his NSF-funded radiocarbon project, over a thousand dates from 300 sites all over the Central Plains, including Colorado, Wyoming. And of course, I, I did some uh, data hygiene with getting the grid of GAT grid dates and geocon dates. Um, and we can get into these. So I, I divided them into three, some probability distributions. Southern, which is Kansas and Missouri. Central, Nebraska is, is Nebraska, Iowa, Northeast Colorado, Southeast Wyoming. And Northern being South Dakota and North Dakota. And we used our carbon, our carbon package, blah, blah, blah. Math, math, math. More math. And this is these are the models we get. So Northern, Central, and Southern. And this red bar in the middle is representing... Um, the year 1450. The blue fields are representing there's less population than should be expected by the model. And the, the red field is representing there is statistical significance. So this is an exponential model. So that gray area is expecting this is what the population should be based on human procreation. Um, the Central Plains and the Plains in general, it doesn't have many dates compared to other areas for a number of reasons. But right when you hit around 950, there is an explosion that is not of population, which is not caused 
by um, procreation. That is that is too exponential. Um, that it, it, sh it must be migration. And more importantly, we can see s the southern SPD, Kansas and Missouri, starts having a higher population increase before central. And you can see that there's a trend between these three, that people are migrating northward and northward around 1450. When this drought is going on, people are no longer in um, you know, Nebraska. And you can see these population declines or um, these shifts in the radiocarbon record where there's not that many radiocarbon dates which are being used as a proxy for population. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean population crash, only because if you, if you know the area, that what we're seeing is an explosion of hamlets across the landscape supported by semi-maze-based agriculture, then around 1450, 1500, we were seeing the initial coalescent variant. We're no longer talking about small villages. Now we're talking about huge earth lodge villages and the, the ratio or, or how a radiocarbon date uh, uh, relates to one another has changed. Um, and we'll get onto that further. So once again, we're seeing the time span of interest 900 to 1600. Um, but the problem with these central point, these SPDs is you look at these and you go, okay, so what? This isn't answering your question. You're just seeing that, you know, this graph is moving in a north to south transition because these SPDs are too coarse in the time scale and they're not related to specific cultural groups. Um, so how do we get past that? And the next part is Bayesian statistical analysis. Um, this is like the up and coming. It's been, uh, you know, statistical method for chronologies. It's been big in Europe and it's really catching on here in the United States. Um, and so this is how we're going to figure this out. So this is this is the bread and butter of this paper and of this of this presentation is is these Bayesian statistical analyses. And we're trying to see this. We're trying to see a couple things. And uh, one, are people coming in from the southeast? And then two is you know, are these cultural chronologies related to one another, or is or is there replacement going on? Um, and there's a lot that goes into Bayesian statistical analyses, and a lot of opponents of this or, or critics talk about playing with your dates, that you play with your models. You can make the numbers do whatever you want, and they're not wrong in a sense, but Bayesian statistical analyses really require um, an expert. You really have to know what you're doing, and you have to ha know the archaeological record to really interpret what's going on. So we're using OxCal, we're using the InCal 13 calibration curve. InCal 14 is coming out soon. I am super excited. Um, and from these, we're using 392 radiocarbon dates because we're at a smaller window and these are limited to specific archeological sites and cultures. Um, one culture or, or you know, archeological culture, the St. Helena phase of CPT um, was omitted because it only had four dates and all of them failed the analysis. So we just had to remove them. And this is kind of a list of what's going on. So all these are coming from five um, archaeological cultures, which, you know, in the literature from 950 AD to about AD 1800. And in order for my models and what I'm doing to be correct, they basically have to pass what we call an A model and A overall greater than 60. This is the same as having a P value that is uh, greater than 0.005. It's that's what it that's what it stands for. These are the counties that my radiocarbon data is coming from. Um, you know, two years to do a master's did not really provide enough time for me to get accurate uh, and precise dates, but this is the best I could do. So just to see, just so you guys can visually see where this radiocarbon data is coming from, which will match to a map later. And this is what you get. Um, this is, this is uh, a year's worth of research condensed into one figure. Um, yeah, this, this was it. So what we're seeing here, um, it's a lot. I understand this is a lot to look at. And many of you guys are going, what is this kid talking about? And I will answer questions. Um, but what we're seeing here is start and end boundaries. The bar underneath these, these, um, bell curves, some of these are bell curves. It's the 99%, 95.4% probability that the start of this cultural sequence is within this model. So really, the more dates you have, so like Smoky Hill, Nebraska, and Itzkari phase, they have a lot of dates. And having a lot of dates allows that chronology or the start time and the end times to be much more concise. 
Steve Kisker. And you can see start PCC, that's post-contact coalescent. There's like four dates because it's post-contact. We know where the villages are. We know what times they're occupied. We don't need radiocarbon dates. You only have four dates. That's what happens um, to, to that. So that's pretty much useless, but we already know what's happening with PCC, but I included it just, just to, for consistency's sake. And this will make a lot more sense. So when you condense all of this into a table where you put the dates are out, um, you see the time ranges for when these archaeological cultures are starting and ending. And these are all bounded geographically. And what do we see? Well, the Upper Republican is the first phase to start. It's really not in the southeast. But then you start seeing Steve Kisker and Solomon River and Smoky Hill. Um, so what is, what is this equating to? Like what's, what's happening? So if we're not coming from the Southeast, well, this isn't really, um, we need to refer to this GIS map before we can really talk about it. So this is once again, I've been word vomiting a lot. Um, these are the three hypotheses, uh, again, Northwestern migration of ancestral Canoans into the central plains, cultural transformation from central plains tradition to initial coalescent variant. And then lastly, if cultural transformation or ethnogenesis occurs, it does so in the mid-15th century. We get back to this map. So first CPT phase must be in the southeast of the Central Plains region. Steve Kisker is the first phase to appear and the Saanish in the Upper Republican River. So what we're seeing is that going back to that oral tradition where the Arikara, the Saanish, say, oh, well, we, we went to southern Nebraska and northern Kansas first. The Upper Republican phase is right along that boundary and up along the Upper Republican River. And then we see the, the Steve Kisker as being the first phase, right? And that's the Steve Kisker phase. So where the Upper Republican is, is ancestral groups that the, the historical Saanish identify with. And Steve Kisker is being represented possibly by the Skeedy or the South Bands coming in. Because the Skeedy, Chodik, Sachedik said they came to the Upper Republican River too. So I think this is supported. And then we get to the second hypothesis. Um, I hope, okay, wow. Um, CPT is ancestral to ICV. So this has been a debate in archaeology for a little bit. Is Central Plains tradition and ICV related? Um, you know, for this to be possible, CPT should end after ICV begins. Campbell Creek, which is ICV, is the first phase to appear. Um, and the ancestral Sanish said he lived in South Dakota before ancestral Tudix Sachedix moved in. And also, if you look at the archaeology more closely, some of those early ICV phases, especially Campbell Creek, Lynch site in Nebraska, where my advisor Doug Banforth is working, the earliest village, the earliest houses there, they're Central Plains tradition houses, and then there's earth lodges. So you have this connection. It's not just this whole new thing. It's we're just seeing an aggregate of CPT people living together. So once again, this, this hypothesis is supported based on the oral traditions and the archaeological record. And then lastly, this is the hardest one. I don't like the word ethnogenesis. And coming from Wyoming, ethnogenesis was not a word we use very often um, in those classrooms. But realistically, and this was kind of a byproduct of doing this research, that we're, if, if extended coalescent variant and lower loop phase are what we know of today in terms of their organization, settlement patterns, material culture as, as proto-historic Pawnee and Arikara, well, when do we see that change? When do we see that happening? And we're seeing in the 16th century that we have you know, CPT is, is, is there's climatic effects that are basically forcing populations or seemingly forcing populations to reorganize and move somewhere else. And as they're reorganizing, they're building bigger villages. And then they split off after being in a, instead of being in these scattered hamlets, now they're in these villages and then they go to their historic homelands. And then we start seeing the pottery that, and, and this is really happening in the 16th century. So the ethnogenesis was not a major focus of what my original research was originally, but it was just kind of a byproduct of, of doing these analyses was, wait, I think there is um, quantitative evidence for some of these qualitative answers. So that's supported. Um, I love this meme. South Park is my favorite. Um, but conclusions. Um, that come out of this. Um, ancestral Cadoans have lived in the Central Plains for hundreds of years, like they've said, and as they've been telling people for a long time. We really need more radiocarbon data. If we really want to make this precise and really look at this, the, and this isn't just talking about the Central Plains, but everywhere, 
we need more radiocarbon data and especially AMS dates on bone and seeds. Um, my thesis um, was used by the cultural resource division of both the Chittix Sachitix and the Kriegeries to really assert NAGPRA claims saying like, hey, there's evidence for in, in, you know, us being here. And then what's the relationship to Plains Woodland? Well, I really didn't investigate that. So really haven't talked about that, but that's what we're doing now is really doing more holistic um, investigations of relationships to this area. Um, and then lastly, so I've talked about the closed man story twice, and this is what we talked about, the Skidi ethnogenesis, um, that if you, you can see Genoa on this map, that part of that closed man story, not only does it talk about um, settlement patterns and uh, and where they moved to, but it talks about this event of the morning star chasing the evening star. And you can look at this like, what does that mean? Well, there, there's an actually an astronomical event in which the the what you know the morning star and evening star are seen together, and it's it's it's, a, it's an eclipse. Uh, it's it's, it's an eclipse of these two stars. And if you look at it that way, and you take up data from NASA to find out when when can you see these? Well, in July and October of 1442, in the middle of the 15th century, that we're looking at, this eclipse was visible in this area near Genoa. Um, so that's fun. Um, and I think that's extremely interesting and really just kind of showing archaeology isn't just bounded by the material, the, the remaining materials, but to be better as anthropologists, take the cultural stuff. We need to take um, the ethnographies, but also start looking at additional evidence because that's how you can make these interpretations, right? Um, and references, I saw it in Dream Indian Joke. Um, there is the reference to my um, thesis, if you want to look at it more, it's really not that long. It's only about like 35, 40 pages of text and like 70 pages of tables and data. And if you want to know more about Bayesian, we did an episode about it with Dr. Eric Robinson on the podcast that I mentioned, and it's called Browing Out Over Bayesian. And we kind of go over a lot of these nuances. Um, so that was a lot. I know it was a lot. Um, I hope you guys are still awake and uh, I will take questions. <laughs> So folks are welcome to put questions in the chat box, um, but you can also unmute yourselves and pose questions. Oh, thanks, Larry. I appreciate that. And yeah. <laughs> Of course. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Todd. Come on, anybody. I gave this presentation in Kansas to a bunch of farmers, and I was there for two hours answering questions. So if I have a bunch of advocational and professional archaeologists, I know you guys have questions. Okay. I want to ask about how you uh, went and dealt with uh, that your population side of it where you used radiocarbon for population and how you really can justify radiocarbon dates as a bit of, as a substitute for population. Absolutely. I, wanna, Ditto. I have this question I, too. I, yeah. I, I absolutely love the Bayesian stuff. The Bayesian stuff is awesome. I'm so happy you're doing that. I want to talk to you more about that on a separate time, but the population bit, particularly in the Great Plains where it has not been like every site's been dated and everything's happened and you have a good basis for sampling. Mm -hmm. It's hard in Europe where like almost every site has a good number of dates and you can kind of start to do that. Sure. There's still some issues there in specific regions if you're going down to a small micro region, but mm -hmm. big scale, the planes there's, just, there hasn't been, most sites aren't dated. So you don't have good dates you're on that. You're absolutely correct. So I had over a thousand dates from like the Central Plains alone. Um, you know, when you're talking about SPDs and population, it, it is, it is, it's, it's an argument and it's, it's using dates as data in terms of if you have, that's why I got rid of the Geochron dates because I didn't want dates from a geological feature because that's not really representing population, but like a hearth or um, a ceramic date, something from a uh, human behavior, that's a representation of that. When I did that analysis, I binned the dates, meaning that any 
date from the same site within a hundred years was collapsed down as one date. So you weren't getting OPRI represented. So like Lynch now has 50 date or 40 date, 30 dates, sorry, to it. So if I was to rerun this analysis again with the Lynch dates, it'd only be represented as one. Um, there's really not a lot of dates that come with little wo late woodland stuff. And I was even using dates, like I did another analysis for Dr. Scott Ortman of like looking just as for fun, if I used all the dates past 3000 years to potentially Clovis or pre-Clovis, that only had like 1500 dates. Um, but what it is, it's not really looking at necessarily how many dates there are, but the ratios and when do we see a, a dramatic rise. Could it possibly be because, well, if we're looking at Farmers Carlton, there was a lot of work done in the 30s with dams. Of course, we're going to get these sites. Absolutely. That there are inherent biases in the data collection. Um, but even still, a lot, if you look deeper, a lot of those sites are still being represented by the hunter gatherers, but there's taphonomic reasons. So that's why, like, the population is kind of like, is this really? But then you start looking at the Bayesian, and it's like, hunter gatherers they're not on the landscape they're they're mobile and then we start seeing horticulturalists so it's there it's it's reasonable more than reasonable to assume like okay when you have farming you're gonna get bigger populations and that all kind of matches up around that 950 um and we've played with more of these played with more of these dates uh, dr bamforth and dr casey carlson and i looking at these relationships um and, and honestly, the bigger one has become realizing that charcoal dates might actually be imprecise by about 200 years. That's kind of been the biggest kick in the teeth to all of this research, that that's what my doctoral stuff is, is like having to go and get AMS dates on a radiocarbon record that is 95% uh, comprised of 95% charcoal. So it doesn't mess up the chronologies, but it moves up the time. And with the SPDs, uh, a lot of work that's done with that. I'm pretty sure they used, they did this a couple times, but there's not many SBDs in the central plains, but uh, Jacob Freeman and Eric Robinson from Utah state have been doing a lot of work with radiocarbon dates as, as data and population. Yeah. I'm familiar with Denon's work. So I was, you, I, I knew that side of it. I just don't want, wanted to know how you were dealing with it in your case. Yeah. It's the, yeah, it's, it's just tying it up with the Bayesian and just knowing, having an understanding of like what's going on and what we can expect to see. It's like you get farmers, you you know, they can be weaned off. It's like, you know, the whole thing with how agriculture took over the world, not because it was better, but because you could have babies quicker. Definitely. Let's see, we have some chat. Um So uh, literature view on period sites that don't have C14 dates. So I didn't do much of a lit review. It was most, it was mostly Bob Kelly and, and um, with his radiocarbon project, getting the initial dates from them and then going to the sites there and working closely with um, Bob Horde from Kansas state and um, Rob Bozell from Nebraska on the radiocarbon, what's going on with the sites. So, you know, it was only a two year project. And as we've expanded, we do recognize that there's a lot of sites that haven't been dated. I mean, that's most of the planes in general, and it's just pottery. Um, so that, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And if it, uh, to expand that would have to be finding all these sites, taking in a, looking at the pottery that's witnessed there and then giving it a 400 year kind of boundary to when it could have, have been possessed and then doing a different kind of uh, statistical analysis that doesn't use radiocarbon. But when we're looking at like 950 to, you know, 1700 is less than a thousand years. If you have a 400 year time span, it's, it's useless. So like a lot of radiocarbon dates I had, especially some of those early ones that had standard deviations greater than a hundred, I got rid of them. Cause it's like, I, you're useless. Um, yeah, it, it's a lot. And I would like more people to do it with me because I'm the only one doing like six states worth of population data and it is miserable. I think we need increased stats literacy, I think, in these programs. Yeah, I'm still really bad at stats. I know like six codes and that's I can tell you everything about running an SBD code. But if you need me to look at pottery variation, I'm, I, you need to ask somebody else. Mm hmm. So are you primarily using R to, to run these tests? Uh, R for um, 
the SPDs and OxCal for the Bayesian. Okay. So if you could design like a next step to extend the impact of this research, what would, what would that or those steps be? So the next step is um, really realizing uh, Donna Roper in 2015 wrote a paper in Central Plains Archaeology, which is, you know, this Mickey Mouse Nebraska State Journal that no one reads. Um, and in it, she identifies for some basic research that like, the time spans for what we know about chronology in the central plains are off by 200 years. Um, and that's kind of what I alluded to about the charcoal dates being bad. So I originally came to Boulder with Doug to expand and create a much greater great plains chronology and population dynamics. But then once we realized over 95% of our dates were inconsistent and also inaccurate that you, that, it's useless. Um, there's been some work once again from Utah state where they've identified and um, how to assign radio or charcoal dates of value. So that way they kind of get pushed around, but in the plains, you need to have a geographic specific um, factor. So that's what my dissertation is, is looking at uh, 12 popular CPT dates that are just charcoal dates. Uh, that just have charcoal, dating them with AMS on bone and seeds and seeing what that difference is. And then you can, uh, then you can figure out, okay, how bad are these charcoal dates and how can you can uh, assign their uncertainty? And then you can redo the chronologies. So that's what we're doing now is because once we realize these charcoal dates are, are bad and it's because, um, what is that darn tree? But there's a tree out in the plains that can last for 400 years. It can, it can sit around. It's not, and it's rare, but it's there. Um, I, I, I know I'll the Latin name. It. Yeah, I know the Latin name of it. Um, it's not cedar. Is it, for, sorry, 200 years. And then you get into the whole method of how do you date trees and what are you actually dating? You're not really, charcoal is not actually dating the target event. It's actually dating when the tree from the smaller rings of the tree when it was born and what's the difference between what you're trying to date and what part of the tree you're dating. So you really get into the science and nitty gritty of how you get a radiocarbon date from charcoal and it gets pretty intense. I could probably just pull up. I have my radiocarbon library right here. Juniper. That's it. Yeah. Oh. Juniper trees can live a long time on the plains. So, and it's dead wood. So if they can last for 200 years, you start a fire after it's been out for 200 years and you burn it and you burn it down to its little core when it was like a one-year-old sampling, you know, you're not dating when it was burned, you're dating when the tree was a sapling. So it's, that's really the problem. Um, and we've, and just preliminary analysis with the that radiocarbon record that I do have, the AMS dates from the same site, from the same component are always um, later in time. Hmm. From, but and it's not consistent. It's anywhere from 50 to 200 years. So it's not like I can just be like, all oh, charcoal dates are 200 years too old. So that's the issue that we're facing. And, it, and yeah. for the purposes of this research, if we're talking about plains migration coming from farmers from 950 and you push that back to 1250, well, nine, 950 is when Cahokia is rising and 1250 is when it's collapsing. So that changes the perception of what's going on. So that's why it's important and it's really cool. And yeah, it'd be cool to see, to just kind of see what's going on. And then also, yeah, it's a lot. It was a can of worms that I really didn't want to open and was just opened accidentally just from me and Doug from reading this one paper and like looking at each other with our mouths open for like 20 minutes, like, Oh, great. This is going to consume a lot of our time from now on. A ton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the working with those margins and your deviations, with the span of time is, I, I applaud your effort. That's impressive. It, it's fun. And what's even better since I don't actually have to do field work, the grants I'm getting and scholarships because I don't have to go to the field. It's, I have a project that requires me to work on my computer. Right. Yeah, PSA, um, Colorado Archaeological Society also has the Alice Hamilton scholarship that, that pays up to $1,000 per, uh, I guess, application. For, uh, for color archaeology students, so, you know. Okay. I'll <laughs> keep that in mind. Shameless I'll put plug. that in my calendar right now. 
Yeah, that's actually one of the reasons that we, you know, hold our annual meeting is that we try to fund that that scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like having played with uncertainty analysis um, for different things, I, I applaud the effort. Um, I know there is an interesting um, metrology package in R mm -hmm. that I've used for some uncertainty analysis, but yeah, curious to see how it can apply to, to dates. Yeah, I mean, it's especially in the US, this whole, it's really kind of new and it's really being spearheaded by a couple people. So it's just, I'm kind of waiting to see what other people are saying. Like the People K, the People 3K project from Utah has, has been very fascinating, especially SBDs and then what they're realizing with Bayesian, because everywhere's having this problem. And I was talking to a colleague who does archaeology comics with me, who does this work in Oceania, and we were talking about our research. And he's like, yeah, so we figured out in the Philippines, we have this old wood problem that's affected our chronologies. And I was like, oh, really? Tell me more. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like everywhere as, as people are doing more Bayesian and more of these packages, everywhere people from a across the globe are realizing that this is a problem, um, especially since a lot of our early radiocarbon data sets were just charcoal because that's what we thought what, you know, could date at the time. Yeah. And now that we have more better, we're re better dating methods, we're realizing what we thought uh, were accurate were really just precise and that precision led us to believe they were accurate. Yeah, those, those two things are not the same. <laughs> exactly. It's amazing how much we learn year after year, decade after decade in this, mm -hmm. this discipline and, and how it affects people. Yeah. And honestly, what, what really kind of sucks about this paper and this presentation is there's a lot more going into this. You know, if you look at the material culture, which is what most people want to see, like, especially with that Steve Kisker phase, you're seeing Cahokian objects, Upper Republican, you're seeing um, Sparoan objects. So like we're just glossing over the material record and really just looking at that statistics um, to tie these in. And uh, that's what always lacks from this presentation is like the cool stuff people want to see. No one wants to just see maps and graphs. Like I realize that is very boring um, and it's a lack of the cool stuff. And I'm slowly working on it as I, as I do this presentation over and over again. Yeah. But your gift game is strong. Yeah. 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 I realize to make, keep people awake, I need gifts and memes. Totally. Okay. I don't want to monopolize the question time. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. I appreciate it, that man. I missed you when I was in Pawnee last week. Um, next time we'll have to meet up. So. Well, and I do have to uh, give a shout out to uh, Michael Knife Chief, who's in the chat. He was um, the TIPA when I first, the Pawnee Nation TIPA when I first started this project, and he helped me a lot with a lot of my source material. Um, uh, and he is, I think he has a master's from OU in history now. So congrats, man. <clears throat> All right. Well, can I ask one more? Yeah, absolutely. So how do you hope this kind of branch of research incorporating like Bayesian statistics into these chronologies will affect people? Honestly, um, uh, my biggest out, outcome I want out of this is for people to look at the, the oral traditions and like the indigenous narratives more seriously. That's kind of the big part of this is I went into this not to compare them, which is better, um, but to show like these are valid and these uh, there are two lines of understanding the past when used together, give a greater understanding of what occurred. Right. And I kind of thought it was funny after realizing the radiocarbon record was wrong because I used the oral tradition. I used that as the method of proof when it turned out to be that method was flawed. Mm -hmm. um, but the big, the whole purpose of this is really kind of showing indigenous oral traditions are valid just because they're not written down. There are these 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 social mechanisms in place to keep them accurate. So you should work with the indigenous community. You should try to find out more about it because that helps you as an archaeologist or a researcher. Because without some of those oral traditions, I would have been at a loss with trying to understand what's going on. But if you kind of have a narrative that, you sh that you're kind of testing against, it, it helps you with your expectations or what you should be looking for. And it makes you think outside of the box. Um, and some of these, like I gave this presentation to the Pawnee Nation back in October after Plains. And the amount of people that talked to me afterwards, like elders that were like, hey, I have my grandmother told me this one thing about this. And like, 
it, it started, the more information I got, the more sense everything made. It was like it, it some of these fine tuned details started coming out. And that was just like, we've always known the Arikara and the Pawnee related. They used to send bushels of corn down to us with a note saying, how are you guys doing type of stuff. So, and then also like, it, it's been fun. Cause you don't read about this in the, in the archeological literature. Like you read archeology, span the great plains and they say they might be related and that's it. Um, because they don't want to step on toes, but it, I've had a lot more fun being with indigenous archaeologists, indigenous people with archaeologists, because we can just sit in a room and just share what we all enjoy because we, we both love the same thing and just have different means of understanding the past. When used together, it gives us greater understanding. Um, you know, I know in some places, like I never would want to be in a meeting with Pueblos and Navajos and them talking about the past and who belongs to what. That is not my forte. And I'd stay out of those fights. I know how he did those get. Um, but some of these other areas, like on the plains um, and Southern plains, especially like I know um, some tribes, especially they talk about meeting Southwesterners and these fights. And like, I'd like to know more about that. So talk to more indigenous people. That's sure. that's what I'd like to see. The TLDR version. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for that presentation discussion. I yeah, loved thank it. Thank you guys so much for hosting me. You know, thank you, Carlton. Uh, thank you. Um, I think you guys have my email. So if you guys have any questions or follow ups, um, please send me an email. I am stuck in my home. I go camping every week in Colorado. But other than that, I'm dying for human attention. So please feel free to email me. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Great to mm -hmm. talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you. And we've linked to Carlton's podcast in the Bayesian episode.